I'd like to introduce Dr. Carly Gage. She's an associate professor of weed science and plant biology in the schools of agricultural sciences and biological sciences at Southern Illinois University Carbondale, SIUC. She completed her BS and MS degrees in biology at the University of Memphis and a PhD in plant biology with a focus on weed ecology at SIUC. Dr. Gage joined the faculty at SIUC in 2015 and enjoys teaching and research in applied management of agricultural systems. <laughs> Dr. Gage's research focuses on weed control in the Midwest U.S. cropping systems and the rotational crops of corn, soybean, wheat, sorghum, and industrial hemp. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gage. Yeah, thanks so much, Stephanie, and the whole ISA team. Thanks for this uh, invitation to be here today. Usually, I have to travel a little farther to talk, but my office is literally just right across the street. So, um, so it's wonderful to see you all here today. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, these things. So, just generally about weed biology and ecology for a minute. Just talk about the winning strategies that weeds have that allow them to succeed. Then we're going to talk about using crop biotechnology to combat them. We're going to talk about resistance evolution and how those changes occur that allow weeds to become resistant. And we're going to talk about a new type of resistance, well, re relatively new, uh, being recognized more in the field now, non-target site resistance. This is metabolic resistance. So I'll tell you the difference between that type of resistance and our older known target site resistance. And then we'll end talking about how to kind of put everything together and use integrated weed management to expand our chemical toolbox to include more practices like cultural, mechanical, and those other types of things. So uh, for the whole concept of why weeds win, uh, the main points are weeds possess biological and ecological characteristics that allow them to become dominant. And if we understand these characteristics, we can target the weak points in their life cycles and predict the ways that they may adapt. And that prediction, if you if you overuse any management practice, it's very likely that the weeds are gonna adapt to overcome that practice. So the key is to know what you're doing in the field and then predict how you may be pushing those weeds to change and overcome your practice. So, um, some of those characteristics, weeds will germinate, grow, and produce seed in a wide range of conditions. They don't need very specific conditions. They, they can do this over, you know, in low nutrient situations, high nutrient situations, a variety of conditions. They are very competitive, as we know, and some of that competitiveness can be linked back to allelopathy. Allelopathy is kind of like chemical warfare for plants. It's a, uh, it's, that the weeds will produce a specific chemical compound they release into the soil or it leaches off their leaves with rainfall or dew. And that chemical compound is gonna influence how the other plants around them respond, including soil microbes. So Palmer amaranth does this. We've actually done trials looking at allelopathy of Palmer amaranth to see how it impacts the growth of corn and soybeans. And those chemicals themselves have a direct influence on how that crop grows. Weeds can grow very rapidly from uh, seedlings to reproductive stage. And we can see this as well with, uh, with water hemp. I don't know how many of you have may maybe have walked into the field in July and seen water hemp plants that are only a couple of inches tall and they're already flowering and producing seeds. So that is a high level of, of plasticity. The, the weeds can, can um, overcome, they can do different things in, in different types of environments. And then extended seed production period, again, that's that water hemp example. Some individuals will produce seed very early, uh, some will produce seed late, and a lot of our weeds are either self-pollinated or cross-pollinated, and those different strategies come with different advantages. Mare's tail is primarily self-pollinated. In order to cross-pollinate between two plants, those plants have to be in roughly a foot distance of each other. So, so mare's tail primarily self-pollinates. That means that all those genes that the, that the mother plant has, 
that plant is passing those genes on to the offspring. That mother plant has been very successful at that particular location. Those offspring are going to be successful at that location as well. Cross pollination is more like what palmer amaranth and water hemp do. They, they, they're male and female plants. They have to cross pollinate in order to produce seed. That allows an incredible amount of genetic exchange. So the plant can pick from any number of genes to be successful in that particular habitat. And then effective seed dispersal. A lot of weeds have um, their own strategies to, to spread their seeds. We do that with, with harvest and even walking through a wet field and picking up mud on our shoes. Um, if you want to know what, uh, what resistances have come into your field with equipment, uh, you just check to see the entry points of your field, right? That's going to be your first introduction of any new resistances coming in on combines or other equipment. And then seed dormancy and longevity. I'll talk to you a little bit of more a little bit more about seed uh, longevity. And seed banks are a critical component of how weeds are successful. So this is just uh, these are some basic numbers. If you start with one plant, and I, I modeled this on either um, water hemp or palmer amaranth, one plant may produce three hundred thousand seeds in one year. Um, in year two, if you start with those three hundred thousand seeds and you estimate an eighty-five percent germination rate, which is realistic um, given what we we found in our research, um, you could get two hundred and fifty-five thousand seedlings. If you have a 95% control rate, which isn't bad, um, you'd be left with 12,750 plants. You estimate that 50% of those are female, so you have 6,375 reproducing plants. That will yield uh, 1 billion, almost 2 billion seeds. So um, if you start then year three with all those seeds and you run the same numbers, 85% germination rate, assuming all those plants survive still, and then you have a 95% control rate. Ultimately, in year three, um, you're looking at um, over 200 trillion seeds in that field. So that shows you, you know, just one plant and how dramatically you can see that population increase. There are a lot of assumptions here, and of course, all those seedlings never survive. There are other factors at play, but, uh, but that's kind of what we're dealing with. And then seed banks are ultimately the long game. Seed banks are what you want to target. And uh, you know, here you see species listed on the left and then the length of seed survival in the soil. And common lamb sporters can survive 39 years. Um, green foxtail, 39 years. Um, here they have red root pigweed as surviving 10 years. So if you kind of have an idea of how long your seed bank is going to persist, that tells you how long you have to have really good weed control on that species in order to decrease that seed thing. Now, um, let's talk about the amaranthus species. So this is water hemp and palmer for a minute. So these are our driver weeds all across the state, across the Midwest. They drive our management decisions. Um, I've already mentioned they're male and female plants, so they have to cross pollinate in order to produce seeds. This is really getting back to the, the basis for their rapid evolution and how they're becoming resistant to a number of different herbicide active ingredients. And they produce 300 to 500,000 seeds per plant. So that's a lot of individuals that are in the field that, you know, if you, if you look at the probability that one of those individuals out of a million is resistant to a pesticide, an herbicide, then the more plants you have, the more likely you're gonna select for that one plant that's resistant. So it's really a numbers game or a probabilities game. Anything you can do to reduce that overall population, there are fewer plants to select from with that herbicide to select for resistance. Now, the um, I can give you a little bit of a, a, a bright spot here in the seed viability story. Uh, so for the amaranthus species, we see that after three years in the field, the seed viability goes down over 90%. So these are not very long-lived seeds, but I showed you what one plant theoretically could do. So you have one plant left in the field after three years, and that's going to, if, if you're not careful, that's going to increase your population again. But the seed bank is really what you need to be focused on here with your management. So we manage the seed bank uh, for a winning strategy, and we want to counterattack with biotechnology. So we have a lot of 
different tools available now. We have a diversification of soybean trait platforms that have expanded the over-the-top use of herbicides now. This allows diversified control programs, but it also will drive resistance evolution if we're not careful. When we're talking about post-emergence applications, those weeds are larger. They're harder to control in general than they are when they're seedlings. So when you're applying post-emergence chemicals, you have to be careful to do it in a timely manner at the right height so that you're not selecting successively over time for resistance evolution. And uh, this has been, this was mentioned earlier. So, you know, good weed control in soybeans begins in corn and vice versa. So this rotational strategy is very important. And that's one of the reasons that my lab is studying industrial hemp as a new potential row crop in rotation with corn and soybeans. And the market's not there yet, but the more things that we can put in rotation, the better. So before genetic modification, um, these were the active ingredients that we had available for use in soybeans. So for our uh, post-emergence options, we really had the PPO inhibitors, that site of action group 14, uh, lactophen, acetylorphan, bemesophen, so think uh, Flexstar, um, Laurent, uh, Cobra. And then pre-emergence, we had uh, photosystem 2 inhibitors. Uh, metribuzin and linuron, uh, again, PPO inhibitors, promesithin, plumioxazin, and sulfentrazone, and then the long chain fatty acid inhibitors, uh, esmetolifor, dimethenamide, and pyroxysulfone. So that was before genetic modification. And now we can add all of these additional site of action groups to this list. So we have now post emergence applications, we have the plant growth regulators, 2,4 D, and dicamba. Um, of course, we have glyphosate, but limited in efficacy on the amaranthus now because of resistance evolution. And then we have uh, glufosinate, uh, cytobacterium group 10, the same PPO inhibitors, and we can add HPPD inhibitors now, um, mesotrine and isoxyfutol. Looking at pre-emergence options, um, we've now added HPPD inhibitors, again, mesotrione and isoxyfutol. So if you look at that group, if you're familiar with, uh, with the resistances that we have in, in Illinois, uh, which of these do we not have resistance to in Illinois? Yes. Yes, it has not, it has not been documented yet. And then metribuzin and Illinois. So um, we're losing, we're losing the tools before they even come available, right? So, um, and uh, you know, other states have uh, have documented um, glufosinate resistance, and uh, and we have some trials also to see if we can uh, we see loss of control. Uh, so we're we're trying to dig into that a little bit. But um, you know, our crop trait platforms allow uh, you know the rotation of chemistries. That's one of the really valuable things about rotating crops from a weed control standpoint. You're able to rotate your chemistries. So some of the it's really great that we have new crop trait platforms. But um, you know, our HPBD inhibitors were typically corn herbicides. It's great that we'll now be able to use them in soybeans, and we won't see any plant back or any uh, yield reductions. Uh, from the use of HPPD inhibitors in soybeans, but we're losing that as a rotational advantage now by allowing those to be used in soybeans. So it's something that is, it's, it's very advantageous, but at the same time, it needs to be stewarded because in the past, that was one of the advantages is that we had to rotate out of that chemistry. So um, when we talk about building programs, um, I wanted to share with you um, the annual report. Uh, well, it's not the full annual report from our research, but we do uh, trials that we present at the Belleville Field Day. Um, so we have uh, soybean showcase trials and corn showcase trials. Uh, we have companies that, that put in their ideal um, systems approaches to weed control, and we test those side by side and we evaluate them. So that's what you're seeing here. This uh, QR code will get you to our, um, our showcase trials. Ultimately, in order to build a program, you need effective sites of action, multiple effective sites of action. In order to do that, you need to know what resistances you have so that you can pick uh, chemistries that are gonna be effective. And you, know, you, you really need a two-pass system with a layered residual. And there are some nuances here. So 
in the past, this uh, multiple effective sites of action, that was the recommendation to slow the evolution of herbicide resistance. When it comes to metabolic resistance, it gets a little bit more difficult. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. Uh, but for now, um, we are seeing an increase in regulatory pressures. And again, this goes back to that rotational strategy and the loss of chemistries potentially. We're going to see some uh, potential new restrictions on the use of atrazine. Um, I've, I've been um, looking for news of this. The comments were due in September, on, on September 6th uh, to the EPA. So we'll see this uh, specifically to address exposure in aquatic plant communities and uh, to propose additional mitigation options to reduce potential exposure and risk to aquatic plant communities. So this is in response to a 40 year backlog that the EPA has looking at the impacts of all herbicide registrations on the Endangered Species Act. So um, EPA was heavily recruiting weed scientists at our national meeting recently. Uh, they do have, uh, they will be expanding staff uh, dramatically to try to deal with this regulatory backlog. So hopefully there'll be an improvement, but there are proposed label changes that have come out and, uh, you know, these are going to be um, geographically based. So they divided, divided um, regions into north and south regions. Um, they've also divided them by, um, you know, watershed. Uh, this, a lot of this was based on a modeling approach to look at the amount of atrazine that was predicted to go into these watersheds. The modeling approach does not back up the actual data on the ground. So the actual data suggests that the parts per billion of atrazine going into these watersheds are dramatically lower than what the model says. So the actual data is low, the model says it's really high, and the EPA is using the model to create these guidelines. So um, that was one of the major criticisms. Um, we're gonna see possibly another pick list. So everybody's getting familiar with pick lists now. Um, one of the big deals that is a concern towards herbicide resistance evolution is that we may see no pre-emergence applications to the crop. We all know that weeds are going to be more sensitive with those pre-emergent applications. If you switch to an, a post-only approach, you're more likely to successively select for resistance. So that's only one of the problems with this pick list. But um, depending on your, your geography and your soil type, you would have to pick uh, multiple of these in order to be compliant. And of course, the whole issue of who's going to come around and, and um, you know, assess how you're doing with your pick list strategies, who's going to manage this program, all of those things are still undetermined. But uh, maybe you'll have to do vegetative filter strips or plant cover crops or contour buffer strips, any number of these things, any number of these things. So when we talk about combating resistance evolution, um, the probability of resistance evolution increases with the number of weeds exposed to the herbicide, especially at the later growth stages. So again, it's a numbers game. It's a probabilities game. And everything that you do in the field will select for something. We'll select for some biotype of that weed with a certain set of genetics that may allow it to overcome what you're doing. Um, I'll give you some ideas here. And the, the term in literature is selection pressure. So you have a population of a weed, you're doing something across that entire population. The, the probability that one of those individuals will survive or more is the selection that I'm talking about. And the action that you're doing is the pressure. So if you, if you continuously crop, um, you know, uh, same crop over and over again, you, you may get weeds that mimic that crop. So broadleaf weeds are going to mimic broadleaf crops. You're going to have uh, more grass weed problems in your grass crops. So that's, you know, that's pretty, um, pretty basic. Um, if you harvest at the same time every year, you're going to tend to have weeds that avoid seed removal at harvest. And I'll talk to you later about some harvest weed seed control strategies, some new things coming out technologically. Um, those harvest strategies are going to push those weeds to maturing earlier and shattering seeds earlier. We already know that. It's just a question of how long we see that and what we can do to integrate into that to combat that. 
So we'll see early maturing species, possibly smaller seeds that leave the combine. And then if we have reduced tillage over and over again, we're going to see weeds that germinate from more shallow depths. So those are going to be smaller seeds that sit on the soil surface or possibly wind dispersed seeds like the mare's tail seed you see here. Um, and then we may shift towards uh, perennial or biennial species as well, less problems with, uh, with annuals. If we overuse a single herbicide active ingredient, we leave, that leads to herbicide resistance. So that we've seen, uh, we've known that for a long time, and we saw that first really in a major way with Roundup or glyphosate use. So the probability of resistance evolution, um, it's, it's really complex and it has to do with all of these different things, management practices, the herbicide that you're using, and the characteristics of the weed species themselves. All those things together give you your overall risk as they come together and interact. So for management practices, you know, the frequency of herbicide use, um, how you can rotate your actives, the availability of actives to rotate, um, your mixes, your sequences, your rotations, your rate and your timing is going to have a lot to do with that. Um, for herbicides, you know, we'll talk a little bit about uh, target site and non-target site resistance next, but that, that those are different strategies that we have to overcome that herbicide. And then the number of species that the herbicide controls, it's residual activity. So we want an herbicide with a long residual if we're talking about a free. But the longer that herbicide sticks around and gradually degrades, those first weeds that pop up after that free use, the first weeds that break are your are likely to be your, your most tolerant weeds. So, so if you start to see your freeze breaking early, then you can, yes, you may have a problem. And uh, the longer the residual activity, the more exposure there is to that chemistry and the higher the selection pressure. So it seems counterintuitive, but... Um, and then weed species, some species are prone to resistance, like our amaranthus species, because of the genetic variability, they have to cross-pollinate in order to produce seeds. Uh, so there's this uh, potential for rapid evolution within those populations. So, um, and this is, this is a graph that um, I show almost in every presentation. It's the increase of resistant weeds globally, and uh, we're up to 515 cases now across the, the world. Um, 128 of those are in the U.S., so that's 25%. That's more than any other country, so we are winning. <laughs> um, the herbicides, though, are we use herbicides as a very simplified prescription for weed control. Uh, we use them over landscapes that are, that are enormous, uh, so enormous amounts of our crop production fields are, are sprayed with herbicides, and that increases the selection pressure or the probability that we're going to select for a resistant individual. So, um, Weeds can be resistant to herbicides in a variety of different ways. Um, if we look at um, across the top, those are the steps to, to an herbicide action. So we have uh, penetration of the herbicide. It has to translocate to the target site. It has to accumulate at the target site and then bind to a protein usually. And then there is the resulting damage, cell death, plant death. So weeds can be resistant by um, having reduced penetration, so the herbicide doesn't get into the leaf as well. Um, weeds can be resistant by um, compartmentalizing the herbicide. So, so mare's tail can do this. Uh, glyphosate resistant mare's tail can take glyphosate and put it into a plant vacuole where it's not gonna be in touch with that, um, with the enzyme that glyphosate needs to bind to. So it kind of sequesters it where it's inactive. Um, so accumulation of the target site protein, so we can have uh, some plants like um, Palmer can produce way more enzyme. So it's producing more of that target and you could almost never get enough herbicide into that plant to saturate that target. The plant keeps functioning. Um, and then we can have mutations at the target site. So when I say mutation, we have the target site, the herbicide is supposed to bind to that target site. Sometimes there's a mutation that the target site just becomes way too open, the binding isn't good, that it's not an effective bind. Sometimes the target site mutates and it's way too small and the herbicide molecule doesn't fit into that target site anymore. There are a number of ways that, um, that those target sites can mutate. And then there can be some protection activities and compensation where um, you know, there's peroxidase activity that helps 
protect the plant. But um, you'll see also enhanced metabolism. So enhanced herbicide metabolism is, is C there in the middle. That is just the plant's ability to tag that herbicide as a foreign compound. It tags it, and then later there are other mechanisms within the plant that come in and break the bonds of that herbicide molecule, and it creates different, um, different products. It breaks it into um, products that are not herbicidal within the plant. It, it just chews it up. It metabolizes it. So we're seeing, or, or we're becoming aware, I should say, of that happening more often. So target site versus non-target site resistance. Um, I can say that little is known about how non-target site resistance evolves. Um, there, it's something that's being studied more. Uh, so this is herbicide metabolism, where the weeds break down the herbicide active ingredient. And you know we've been taught over and over to use herbicide mixtures. That the most effective way to slow resistance evolution is to put multiple herbicide active ingredients into the tank, multiple effective herbicides. I said that earlier. So when we do that, there is the suggestion that we may be selecting for a more general mechanism. So it's no longer the target site mechanism where the target site is changing, the weeds are evolving so that the herbicide doesn't bind anymore. It's now the generalist mechanism where the weed sees a foreign chemical, tags it, and breaks it down. So when we use herbicide mixtures more, it's possible that we're selecting for metabolic resistance more. So um, if we look at the way that, um, that plants metabolize herbicide, uh, crops do this all the time. That's why crops, we see crop safety, right? We can use herbicides in our crops. Uh, corn, if this is for atrazine, uh, the amount of atrazine metabolized in six hours. Corn will metabolize 96% of that atrazine application in six hours. Fall panicum will metabolize 44%, giant foxtail 17%, and oats 2%. So oats are very sensitive to atrazine. Corn is not sensitive at all. So um, this, is, uh, this is the same mechanism. So corn breaks down atrazine in a very similar way that weeds would begin to metabolize herbicides. And uh, this is a slide from Aaron Hager, University of Illinois. So this is looking at the historical evolution of target site versus non-target site resistances in Illinois. Um, in the 1990s, you know, we saw um, target site resistance to ALS inhibitors, photosynthesis 2 inhibitors, uh, in the 2000s, TPO inhibitors and ALS inhibitors, different mechanism, uh, 2010s, um, EPSPS gene amplification, and then again, EPSPS uh, mutation. Non-target site resistances uh, more recently, right, 2000s, um, atrazine, uh, 2010s, glyphosate, HPPD, atrazine, ALS, uh, 2,4-D, and the group 15s now. And the group 15 is, is very problematic for us, um, for everyone, really, because those are overlapping residuals. So, you know, you're supposed to put a, a soil residual in the tank when you come back with your post-application. Um, right now, this is just a very localized population that's resistant to the group 15s in Illinois. But if we saw that spread, then that would put in jeopardy the use of our overlapping residual systems. And then uh, this is just a list for water hemp. Um, the, this really shows the amazing ability of water hemp to evolve resistances. And this kind of gives you a, an idea of what we're dealing with. Um, but we have all these resistances, side of action group 9, 15, 2, uh, 5, photosystem 2 inhibitors, uh, 14 now, you assume that your population is PPO inhibitor resistant. Um, HPPD inhibitors, um, again, this is uh, somewhat more localized. Not everyone has a problem with this. And then synthetic auxins, again, somewhat localized. There is a relationship, it appears, from the literature between the evolution of HPPD inhibitor resistance and the synthetic auxin resistance, in particular 2,4-D. And that goes back to this metabolic resistance. There may be a link between the plants that are able to chew up um, HPVD inhibitors that may allow them to better metabolize our synthetic auxins. 
So how do we manage non-target site resistance? Um, well, herbicide rotation in this case would not be particularly effective because there's no fitness cost, meaning that the weeds are resistant, but they're not exhibiting any um, detrimental effects. They're still surviving, photosynthesizing, reproducing just as well. Herbicide combinations are very effective for target site resistance, and I don't want to downplay that because right now that's still our best way to slow resistance evolution. I don't want to tell you to not use multiple effective sites of action. And absolutely, put as many things in the tank as you as, as you can to have as many effective sites of action. Um, but um, this is less, uh, this is going to help you less with non-target site resistance, with metabolic resistance. Um, so what remains effective in those populations can, can vary depending on the population, right? And then um, how do we overcome metabolism? So um, there, there may be some synergists that we can put in the tank to make those herbicides a little bit more effective. Um, there are, this is a slide from Aaron Hager. Um, so Aaron's colleague, Pat Trannell, is looking at gene silencing systems for water hemp. And the idea would be that you would introduce uh, water hemp into the field, male plants that would spread pollen that have a gene silencing mechanism, and it would cause those female plants to produce inviolable seed or to not produce seed. So that would be a way to, to combat this. You have to introduce the weeds and then allow that to move through the generations. And then non-herbicidal strategies, um, I'm going to end the presentation talking about some integrated weed management strategies that you could do possibly to help um, sort of combat this, uh, this effect that we're seeing. So I've shown these slides for a while now, but I just wanted to mention them briefly. So we've been doing dicamba resistance screens. Well, we've been collecting uh, weed seeds at harvest for about seven years now, and we've been uh, part of this study that's funded by the United Soybean Board. These seeds are, are being screened for herbicide resistances. Uh, we, we're screening for dicamba, um, 2,4-D, and glufosinate. So in the counties that you see in blue, there were no survivors in any of the replicates that were screened. These are flats in the greenhouse where we, I, I say we, this, these went to either Kevin Bradley at the University of Missouri, uh, Brian Young at Purdue, or uh, Jason Norsworthy at the University of Arkansas. So they, they had flats where they spread the seeds onto the flat. They allowed the weeds to grow up and reach three to four inches in height. And then they sprayed the entire flat with that herbicide active at either a half rate or a full rate. Blue means that there were no survivors in any flats. Yellow means there were survivors in at least one flat. Red says there were survivors in every single flat that they sprayed. So if we look a little bit more into that, um, so we do see some red counties here in Southern Illinois, and you can look at the percent survival in the graph. Uh, so you see the half rate and the full rate of dicamba, and uh, it looks like there's a successive decline in resistance over time. Um, so that's something else to, uh, to investigate. The, the camp is really hard to screen in the greenhouse because the plants seem to linger. Like even if they're susceptible, and we know they're susceptible, they just, it takes them forever to die. So it's really hard to, to get an, a full, full understanding of the resistance in the greenhouse. Uh, glufosinate or Liberty, um, again, the same screens were done. Um, same thing, blue, red, yellow, and red. And uh, again, we're seeing red counties. And uh, at, even at the full rate in 2020, um, there was about a 20% survival estimate across, um, across those sites. So uh, we have actually taken uh, some of these populations from Southern Illinois that seem to show uh, just some sort of control failure for, for both glufosinate and dicamba. We went back and we collected those seeds and Christiana Ronkreith is with us here today. Uh, she's running these screens for us to see if we can truly confirm resistance. And maybe next year I'll have new data for you to show you what we found in those populations. But we do know that glufosinate is a very sensitive herbicide, and I love this work that Peter Sigma at the University of Guelph has done. So he had his graduate students go out every three hours, which sounds like a nightmare for graduate students. But um, he had to make applications every three hours to look at velvet leaf control. And you can really see this daily, this diurnal pattern in the applications. We know that glufosinate and most herbicides work better when the plants are actively growing and actively photosynthesizing. So it makes sense that applications around noon, a little after, are going to be the most efficacious. But you can really see this with the glufosinate data, and there's a difference, a 79% difference between those 6 a.m. applications and those applications that happened at noon. And this uh, very clearly shows up in the corn yield data as well. 
uh, you get better weed control, you get better yield. And there was a 48 bushel per acre difference in uh, in the weedy or in the uh, 6 a.m. and the other trials. So we do uh, we are going to see some new technologies coming on board. Uh, this is just one of them. So we have a, a new mode of action that's being publicized by Bayer. That's going to be here in 2030. Um, it would be the first um, herbicide mode of action commercialized in about 30 years. Um, it is going to be focused on grass weeds and row crops. So um, it maybe won't be the solution for amaranthus problems, but um, this will be the seventh genetic modified crop crate to allow over the top applications. So now that brings us to integrated weed management. So um, we want to use our chemical control toolbox and we want to integrate as many other control tactics as possible. This will allow us to slow resistance evolution. It'll allow us to have fewer individuals in the field to select from with our herbicide applications. So um, when we think about ways that we can combine other tactics, um, so SIU is part of this group, getting rid of weeds through integrated weed management, it's the GROW group, uh, that's the website. This is uh, focused on an integrated approach that will um, really protect the environmental, human, and economic well-being in our agricultural systems. And we really want to focus on combining chemical control with all of these other management tactics. So we have the chemical control of herbicides and our crop trait platforms. Um, one of the mechanical options that we'll have more and more, that we'll see more, is um, harvest weed seed control. And then, of course, the cultural tactics that we have, diversified rot rotations, um, narrowing our crop rows, using cover crops, and using interseeded crops, potentially. And then um, biological controls are not really an option that much for us in the Midwest. We don't have anything right now that's going to target amaranthus species. There are things out there that eat it, but they aren't, um, they're not going to really solve the problem. But, um, but we, can, we can allow those biological, those seed, seed predators to do, uh, we can enhance the habitat for those to improve uh, the numbers of those in the field. And then prevention, um, cleaning equipment when you can before you move it from field to field. So um, really diversity is the key. I've talked to you about diversity in your herbicide program. I'm gonna to talk to you about diversifying all your management tactics through integrated weed management. But if we, um, we also want to have um, diverse weed communities in our fields, right? So uh, uh, what we have now mostly is a dominant weed. So we have one, maybe three weeds that dominate the cropping system with the amaranthus species being at the top. So what we want to have is a lot of different species in the field, all of which are easy to control. So that would be the goal. <laughs> no, no weeds would be a good goal as well, but we're gonna have weeds. We just want them to be easy to control with the tactics that we're, that we're using. And uh, this is something that John, uh, John would be able to really address. But um, you know, when you start using integrated weed management tactics and you start putting other things into um, into combination, you can see some unintended effects of those practices. Uh, so slugs are a great example. And I don't know whose picture this is. I got it from Terry. So um, thank you, Terry, for the picture. But um, but slugs have been an issue with cover crops in the past. Um, interception of soil residual herbicides are a big factor, and that's something that we're digging into a little bit more with the uh, within the academic community, with, our, with the university research. We're trying to figure out how um, cover crops intercept uh, those herbicides and what that may mean evolutionarily as far as the evolution of herbicide resistance. Um, and then reduced coverage on the weeds, potentially. And we've seen this a little bit with some of the work we've done in standing cereal rye. And interception is not as big of a deal if you're rolling your cereal rye and then making your applications, but in a standing cereal rye crop, you may be having less interception on those weeds below the standing cereal rye. And we've seen that in particular with glufosinate applied post where coverage matters. And then, uh, so this interaction, you can see the spray pattern here. Um, so when you, when you apply herbicides over the top of cereal rye, um, the cereal rye does block some of that herbicide and prevents it from uh, getting to the soil surface. So there's an interaction here between the type of herbicide, so the water solubility of that herbicide, and how quickly afterwards you get a rainfall and how much photodegradation there is. So how much does the sun break down that herbicide as it's sitting on top of the residue. So um, SIU is involved in two large um, multi-state projects looking at uh, planting green. And herbicide residue is, uh, is one component of the project that is 
funded by the United Soybean Board and led by Rodrigo Worley at the University of Wisconsin. Um, here you, you're seeing data from glumioxazin, but we're looking at uh, glumioxazin and pyroxysulfone as our freeze that we're assessing. And uh, the top row there is Illinois. So when we when we have a no free, of course we didn't detect any chemical in the soil underneath the cover crop. Uh, when we use a free with no cover crop, that's what you see in the green bars there. That's how much herbicide was found in the soil. And Tom Mueller at the University of Kentucky is our University of uh, Tennessee at Knoxville is uh, analyzing these data for us. When we have an early terminated cover crop. You can see the blue bars there. That's how much got to the soil. So early terminated means less biomass, less to catch the herbicide before it hits the soil. And then late termination, this would be our um, fully developed standing standing cereal rye, uh, terminated at anthesis. And uh, you can see the amount of herbicide that hit the soil at those times. So um, when we go back and look at this, obviously we're seeing, um, well, in some cases, maybe not in Pennsylvania, there, the third row, we're generally seeing less herbicide hitting the soil surface underneath the cereal rye. So is that going to interact with resistance evolution? You know, we, we've been taught that we need to get a 1x rate on the ground for effective weed control. Obviously, we're getting a one less than a 1x rate, but the cereal rye itself is doing a lot to suppress the weeds. So the, the question of what this means as far as our chemical usage um, is still is something that we're trying to figure out, really. And I have a feeling a lot of this has to do with the how fast we got a rainfall after this application. And then um, this is a project that we've been working on for some time now, interseeding winter wheat and soybeans. So we plant the winter wheat either right before soybean planting or with soybean planting. We allow it to grow and we terminate it at a, at a given time. And we found that with the with adequate rainfall and adequate moisture, if we terminate before D5, we don't see any yield hit in the soybeans. And sometimes we see suppression from the wheat that is equivalent to our best pre-emergent herbicide program. So there was a lot of interest in this. This is now a, um, a, a national project with eight states involved. Uh, again, funded through the United Soybean Board. Uh, we have a couple of collaborators that were interested enough to do this without funding even. So, uh, so that's been really exciting to see how this has expanded. And it all started with, uh, with SIU wheat scientist George Capusta, who was, um, you know, George Capusta retired in 1996. Uh, and he did this project, his master's thesis, um, looking at the influence of duration of annual grass interference on broadleaf weeds and soybeans. And he was using giant foxtail instead of wheat. And we thought that that would probably not be a popular practice if we promoted the use of giant foxtail for wheat suppression. And then seed predators, I don't want to downplay the importance of seed predators. These are beetles, crickets, um, even, uh, even small rodents can, um, can eat seeds. But you may have seen these black beetles run as you're walking through the field. Um, they can eat a, a huge quantity of amaranthus seeds. Um, we don't see them in all of our fields. It, it has to do with the, the areas surrounding the fields. Um, you know, if you have forests or wetlands surrounding your fields, you probably have a higher population of these guys in your field. Um, there's the, the practice of being promoted in some areas now to plant um, a trap crop or a beetle bank. So you plant strips in your field just to promote the existence of these seed predators that are going to expand out and eat the seeds. Um, you know, the, it's, it's variable. So um, if you have the beetles, they can eat uh, from 5% to up to 70% of all the seeds produced in a season. Um, but again, landscape really matters and they need cover. You know, they need something that's gonna uh, provide good habitat for them. So I'm really excited about this. Um, harvest weed seed control. It's not gonna be the answer to everything, but it's a new strategy that I think is gonna be very effective. Um, this is something that the Australians are bringing now forward. Um, there, a lot of this technology has been developed in Australia. It's really just an approach to managing the seed bank at harvest. Uh, so there are all these methods now to, um, you know, either destroy the seeds, like you're seeing in the image. Uh, there's now a, a, a relationship between Redicop and John Deere. So you can buy uh, units that can be installed in your combine and they uh, pulverize the seeds. They crack the seed coat before the seeds go back out onto the field. Uh, but there are a number of different methods that are still considered harvest weed seed control, and some of them can be very cheap. Um, so Australians 
have used um, chaff cart. This is maybe not ideal because you're taking all that biomass and taking it off the field. There go your nutrients and your residue. So maybe that's not a great idea. Um, they've used narrow windrow burning, but um, you know, I was visiting farmers in Australia in uh, December of 2019 when Australia was burning. So um, I think the, the levels of excitement for narrow window burning have significantly diminished in Australia. And then there's a bale direct system where you bale up the residues and use them for food, but you're also capturing the weed seeds at harvest. Um, I'm more excited about the ones on the bottom. So chaff lining. This is where you put a shoot on the back of your combine and you funnel the fine particulates of the crop as well as the weed seed into a line in the back. Now, well, I'll tell you more about that because we, we're looking at that as, as uh, with some of our research. Impact mill, mills, that's the Redicop unit, the integrated parent and seed destructor, um, and um, leaving one out, the De Bruin. De Bruin has a model as well. And then chaff tram lining is basically the same as chaff lining, except you have two shoots at the back of your combine and you're funneling the seed behind your tires. So every time you move through the field, you're, you're driving over the chaff so that you're suppressing any of the weeds that may emerge from that. Um, so this is, uh, this is just a diagram. If you wanted to do something like uh, chaff lining or even the um, seed impact mills, um, you know, you'd have a, a baffle uh, possibly installed in your combine, you have to separate the straw, the larger uh, residue fractions from the smaller ones, which would be the chaff and the weed seeds. And the chaff and the weed seeds are what are funneled out the back of the combine. The earliest um, implement was the Harrington seed destructor designed by Ray Harrington. He was a farmer and amateur engineer. So he came up with this on his own um, and it was using coal mining technology. So he put in these, uh, these metal um, like uh, drums, and they spin in different directions at a very high velocity. The seeds uh, shatter, basically. They're, they're um, ricocheted around this, uh, this drum to the point where the seed uh, coat is crushed, and it reduces the viability of even the smallest seeds, even water hemp, at, um, I believe it's over 95% destruction as water hemp moves through the uh, seed destructor. And now there are a number of, of different uh, seed destructors uh, different models, and uh, and it's no longer a pull behind system, which is what you see here. These are now being integrated into combines, such as this. So this is uh, this is the Redicop unit, and I mentioned Redicop and John Deere. Um, basically, these units just destroy the seed before they go back into the seed bank. So this is true seed bank management at harvest. So um, if we look at chaff lining. You know, the, the first image that you see would actually be chaff tram lining because you see the two rows there. So those would be funneled out the back um, and, you know, at the tires. Uh, but there's the possibility to band herbicide applications specifically on these. Um, there are a number of things that could be done, right? You could use a non-selected herbicide. You could, I mean, if we got labels to do that, you could, um, you could apply something within that band that um, would, you know, maybe not be a current product that we have, a current tool in, in our crop production systems. And then um, we have seen, so this is uh, this is research from um, the world's leading expert, Michael Walsh, on harvest VT control. He is an Australian scientist. Uh, we see in, uh, in one of these lines, herbicides plus harvest VT control, and then herbicides alone. And you can see the difference that herbicides plus harvest VT control make in that bottom line. So you combine those two practices and you can get very effective reduction of um, here, this is annual ryegrass plants per meter squared. So again, it's all about combining multiple tactics when you can. Uh, we've done some work with uh, seed viability in chaff lines. So when we first started doing this study, there was, there was no data. And uh, now the first paper has been published out of Australia, finally looking at seed viability in chaff lines. But we thought, hopefully we hoped, that the seed would go into the chaff line and then decay faster because it's in this mass of decaying uh, crop residue. Unfortunately, we found that the chaff line seems to protect the seed a little bit more. And if anything, we're seeing the same or maybe even greater viability in our chaff line over time. So that's not what we hoped, but what we do see that we can show is that over time, we're, we're isolating the seeds into this line. So we can see a 94% reduction in the rest of the field 
and we're isolating the seeds in this line where we can deal with them, right? It's not going to be aesthetically pleasing, right? If you're if you drive by somebody's field who's chaff lining, they're going to have you know lines of water hemp coming up in their field. But hopefully that'll make it possible to go back and deal with that, even if it's just a mechanical removal, mowing, or or whatever can be done within that space. Um, so uh, so that's effectively what we're seeing here. Um, you know, we had this uh, multi-state trial looking at seed viability and chaff lines, again funded by the United Soybean Board, and uh, and of course we see. Uh, dramatically lower viability in our southern sites like Louisiana, no matter what we do, right? Because it's warmer temperatures and greater seed decay in our southern sites compared to Wisconsin, where you know Wisconsin seed can last for longer. It's like they're in refrigeration. So, um, so that's what we found there. And then we've been doing a little bit of work with uh, the University of Missouri on the weed zapper. So this was uh, a study that we did with Kevin Bradley, and uh, they brought the weed zapper onto campus here. This is using a copper boom on the front of a tractor. Um, there is 15,000 volts that go through the plant. The generator on the back of the tractor that you see here is uh, powerful enough to power three households. So we had to stay really far back from the weed zapper as it was moving through the field as far as a, a risk, a human health hazard. Um, but it was uh, it was somewhat effective. You know, um, there was uh, the, the caveat here is that the weeds have to be above the soybean canopy and it's more of a rescue treatment. So the first year that the weed zapper came through, um, we were the first university on the list, and uh, there wasn't as much difference in height between our water hemp and our soybean plants, and we zapped some of the soybean plants trying to get to the water hemp. So this would be a better scenario when you have taller water hemp, and we also found a difference in the speed of movement as well. So um, three miles per hour is better than five miles per hour. That's both really slow. So, um, so there. There's some issues there, um, but as a rescue treatment, maybe maybe it would be a possibility. And then um, as far as uh, techno fixes, so technological fixes that may be coming in the future. Um, you, the images here are from Dr. Mutu Bhagavathyanan at Texas A&M. Um, Dr. Bhagavathyanan is involved in this GROW group. Um, he's leading our technological uh, studies within the group. Um, so he's doing a lot with, um, you know, autonomous vehicles, field mapping of weed infestations. Um, as, uh, as collaborators, um, we are collecting images. We're building a digital image repository of um, hundreds of thousands of images within the group. Um, this will be open access. So anyone can use these images to train sensing technologies. And um, hopefully that'll help advance the field. Because right now, all the images are proprietary. If one company is working on the technology, they own all the images to train their sensors. So the hope is this would dramatically expand capabilities and give people more tools to develop these kinds of technologies. But um, in the future, you know, we'll see drones flying over the field and mapping weed infestations, and then immediately creating a map that feeds back into the sprayer that's coming along behind the drone and making spot applications. And, you know, John Deere is already doing a lot with this with their sea and spray technology, which is working really well. Um, so it's just the, it's kind of where things may be going. So in conclusion, we need very weak control practices, but these may pose their own distinct challenges. And that goes back to the, the complications that can be involved when you start using things like cover crops and you have to deal with, you know, um, soil moisture issues and all kinds of other ecological interactions. Um, but Really, we need we still need good stewardship. We need varied practices. We need two pass systems still with overlapping residuals, multiple effective sites of action, and timely applications on actively growing weeds. And sometimes that's really hard. Those timely applications, it's difficult to get across the acreage. And if you're going through a drought and the weeds aren't photosynthesizing and you have to make that application, then you know sometimes we're at the mercy of Mother Nature. So um, that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, if you um, if you want my presentation, same as the other speakers, just email me. And um, also, if you would like those showcase trials or anything from our annual report, I'd be happy to give that as well. And uh, I want to recognize Eric Miller. So Eric's our assistant scientist for our lab. He's here today, and uh, he runs all of our field trials. So if you have questions about our systems work, you can also talk to him. Thank you.